This is chapter 19, seizures and syncopal episodes. So uh, a seizure basically is a disorganized discharge of electro electrical activity in the brain. People are born with epilepsy. They have these conditions and they're managed with med different types of medications essentially. There's various types of seizures. The one that's most commonly seen and the reason why we usually get called out for seizures is called the generalized tonic-clonic seizure. It's also known, also known as a grand mal seizure as well. Um, this is the one that causes the whole body convulsions and that's very frightening to bystanders to see and is potentially dangerous to the patient if they fall or fall off their bicycle or crash their car or fall down a flight of steps during this process. If the person is able to get to a position of safety, if they lie down on the floor or if they lay down in bed and have it, um, these generalized grand mal seizures are not harmful to the patient in any way. They recover pretty quickly. Once the seizure stops, usually in about half a minute, minute, maybe, maybe minute and a half or so, they go into what's called a post-ictal phase. And this is the recovery phase. They're going to be disoriented. Uh, and uh, might even be unconscious for a few minutes, but they will recover. After five, ten minutes, they're awake, they're alert, and they're back to their normal mental status. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of seizures. There's two general categories of seizures. Primary seizures are the ones people are born with. This is the epilepsy. Uh, the generalized seizure is that whole body shaking that we talked about just a few seconds ago. And there's your partial seizures. These are partial because they only affect one part of the body and there's no whole body involvement, no whole body shaking going on. And we normally don't get called out to partial seizures because usually um, the family is aware of this person has this condition, the co-workers, the patient, and they're not frightening to them and they have not yet progressed. Now these can progress into a generalized seizure uh, and that's just another phase a person's going through. And they, if it does progress, well, then we might get called out for that whole body grand mal seizure. Secondary seizures look exactly the same as primary seizures. The difference is the cause. So this is a person who's taken too much cocaine or amphetamine products. They're withdrawing from drugs. Uh, it's possible also as well as alcohol too. Uh, pregnancy, uh, uh, patients who are in their last three months of pregnancy, they can get what's called eclampsia of pregnancy, which can lead to these seizure disorders. Uh, fever primarily can cause seizures in infants and small children. It's actually a fairly, fairly common call that we go on. And of course, trauma. Now, trauma, if you get hit in the, hit in the head with a baseball bat and you have bleeding into your cranial vault, you can have seizures but also you can have ongoing seizure condition after that. So people with uh, traumatic brain injuries can have seizure disorder after the, the actual traumatic event because the brain remodels and the scar tissue leads to this, this seizure disorder. Now normally if a person's going through a generalized grand mal seizure for whatever reason why they're in this whole body seizure, most of them last no more than about 90 seconds. So think about it from, from the perspective of EMS. Let's say there's a person working at McDonald's. They're in the kitchen. They have a grand mal seizure. The coworkers witness this. They call 911. You jump in the back of your you know, fire truck, ambulance. You're driving to the call. It takes you six and a half minutes to get to the, to the McDonald's. Well, by that time, this person's seizure would have stopped and they would have been in this now post-ictal phase. They're on, they're on the floor of the kitchen, they're sweaty, they're tachycardic, uh, they're confused, their blood pressure is elevated, their oxygen saturations are low. Uh, this is a typical presentation of a patient who's just finished having a seizure. They could also have oral trauma because during the seizure they bit their tongue or they bit the inside of their, their mouth they could also have urinated on themselves or defecated on themselves. Again, these are all common findings of that postictal phase. And again, after a few minutes, uh, this person is going to start talking to you uh, and within five or ten minutes should be fully awake and oriented to their normal previous status. 
What we're really worried about here is called status epilepticus. Now, what happens with these grand mal seizures, during the seizure, the actual seizure contractions, they're not breathing. And so you can hold your breath for a minute, a minute and a half, and there's no, there's no lasting effects. But when you, if you arrive on scene, if you're an EMT on fire truck or an ambulance, and you arrive on scene six and a half minutes after the 911 call, and this person is still seizing, that means they haven't been breathing for about six minutes. And this now is a truly life-threatening condition. It's called status epilepticus seizure. And they're pretty rare. I maybe encounter three or four a year in my, in my job, uh, but they're out there and they are truly uh, life-threatening to the patient. So here's the definition. Now this definition is based on the County of San Diego protocol, and I, I totally agree with it. For the one reason is, is while this person is actually having the seizure, they're not breathing. So, and I've seen these seizures last up to 35 minutes uh, before. So if you think about it, if someone's not breathing for 10 minutes and 15 minutes, or their breathing is in, ineffective for 10, 15, 20 minutes, it can lead to severe hypoxia, which can lead to severe brain damage. So if you're in the back of the ambulance and you're, you, or the fire truck and you drive to the scene and they're still seizing, that's a status of epileptic seizure and you need rapid intervention. Uh, best way to treat these people is if they've fallen, um, get them up onto your gurney, loosely strap them to the gurney, get in the back of the ambulance and start driving towards the closest ALS, uh, whether it's paramedic or whether it's a hospital that has an emergency room, the closest ALS uh, facility because they can stop the seizure with medications. In the meantime, fix the breathing problem. Take your BVM out. Uh, try to gain some type of seal as best you can and ventilate as best you can. Don't worry about once every six seconds. Just try to squeeze in a couple breaths a minute is better than nothing with this. Now, there's another version of this, and it's called any seizure without a lucid interval. Now, normally when someone has a grand mal tonic-clonic seizure, they'll seize for a minute or so. They'll stop seizing. They'll go into the postictal phase. You'll get there, and they'll be talking to you. They might still be disoriented, but they're talking to you. Now, on the other hand, if a person has a seizure, they stop seizing. They remain unresponsive, and then they seize again. And then they remain un unresponsive when they stop, and then they seize again. They have a series of seizures, and they don't wake up between the seizures. That's also considered a status type of seizure. Now, people that are, are seen with these are people withdrawing from alcohol, uh, people who uh, have metabolic imbalances. And again, primarily, this is the patient who's pregnant, going through eclampsia. And people with hemorrhagic strokes, you see this on them as well. Again, this is pretty rare. I see three or four of these a year. And uh, the last gentleman I had uh, a few months ago, uh, even with all our medications, we couldn't stop it. They actually wanted to have it, having to stop it at the hospital. So he seized for about 30 minutes or so on the way to the hospital. So it was kind of a, one of those long, uh, long drives to the hospital. Again, truly life-threatening. And your primary goal is recognize they need care quickly, and then bag valve mass ventilations. You can try a nasal pharyngeal airway, but because of the contractions, it might not go into their nose because of the, the uh, muscle contractions in their face. So signs and symptoms of seizures really depend upon the type of seizure. Um, the grand mal tonic-clonic seizure is that flexing and extension of the muscles uh, they can have excessive saliva, so they're foaming at the mouth, essentially. If they bit their tongue, it could be bloody foam. They could have urinated on themselves or defecated on themselves. The, um, the chewing motion or movement is more associated with the partial seizures. The, the partial seizures, uh, because it's, 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 it's more of a, a repetitive motion type of of condition. Also, they'll, they'll also do something over and over again. They'll open and close a box repeatedly, like for, for like five minutes, and that's another type of, of seizure, that, that motion or movement. So I'll talk about the uh, types of seizures. So generalized tonic-clonic seizures, the grand mal seizure, uh, again, the most common one out there. 
And so when a person has a seizure disorder, uh, and not everyone goes through all of these phases, but initially the person, when a seizure is about to come on, the body tries to warn the person and it does this through an aura. An aura can be a sensation of a bad taste in their mouth, a funny smell. One lady told me that when she feels fear or feels danger is present, she knows that a seizure is about to come on. Now this gives them about 20 or 30 seconds to sit down on the floor, lay down in bed, pull the car over to the side of the road, whatever it takes to get them out of danger essentially. Once they pass through this aura phase, they become unconscious. And if they're, if they're driving their car, if they're walking up a flight of stairs, if they're riding their bicycle, if they're standing, they're gonna fall and they're gonna get hurt. So this is really the risk to people going through these seizures is the trauma related to the fall once they go into their seizure. Their body will arch, as you see in the little picture right there, that's the tonic phase, and then they go into that tonic-clonic phase where they're flexing and extending the body, they're shaking, and this goes on, like I said, about 90 seconds at most, and then they fall into that post-ictal state, which is more than likely where you're going to encounter them. And our job there is if they have fallen, if they have bumped their head, uh, then you're going to have your partner hold manual inline stabilization of the head and neck. Uh, you're going to suction the airway as necessary. Remember, the seizure now has stopped, so it's safe to do so. And uh, talk to them. They're going to be really frightened. Uh, they're not going to know what happened. They're going to be very hypoxic because of the not breathing for 90 seconds or so and uh, they're gonna get sweaty and tachycardic and all those things we talked about. So just talk to them repeatedly, tell them they had a seizure, tell them you're here to help them. And within a few minutes, they'll become more cooperative and answer your questions more appropriately. And within about five minutes, they should be back to normal. Now I did have a video for this and I do apologize for some reason my, my computer is just not doing good things today. But again, the ground mall seizure is that whole body shaking. It can be rather frightening. And um, when they do have that initial uh, contraction, that initial tonic contraction and the onset of the seizure, they'll actually cry out or scream out. And what that is, is all of their intercostal muscles in their, in their, uh, in their chest wall contract and it forces all the air out of their lungs, causing them to scream or cry out. So during the seizure, they're not really taking a breath back in again, and you can see why they become hypoxic so quickly. Your job really with this is that they're still seizing or, they're, or they start seizing again in front of you, is just make sure that they're, they're not going to hurt themselves. Put a pillow under their head so their head doesn't bang against the hardwood floor, move furniture away, uh, and you can try putting them on their side if there's any secretions in their mouth, even as they're seizing, it's okay. It's usually, it usually shouldn't really hurt them. You, you just don't want to hold on to them tightly because their muscles are contracting so much you can actually tear their muscles and their, their attachments and their ligaments and all that. Another type of seizure is called a simple partial seizure. And this is uh, used to be called a focal seizure years ago. And because it was a focus of one area of the body, uh, usually an arm or a leg or even the head sometimes will just shake. And we don't get called out to these usually because the person, the patient, is awake. They're aware they're having a seizure. The family knows they have this disorder. Their co-workers are aware. It's not frightening in appearance, so it's no big deal. They last a few minutes, five minutes, ten minutes sometimes, and they go away. The time we get called out for these is when they progress into a complex partial seizure or even a grand mal seizure. So this person can have these simple partial seizures for years and they're manageable and then suddenly one day they go, they start out with a simple partial shaking of the right hand or right arm and then it progresses to a whole body grand mal seizure. And then yes, of course, that's when we get called out for it. Just listen to the history of the, of the witnesses, you'll get an idea of what the what the onset was. Now complex partial seizures uh, are a little different. Um, the reason why I bring these up is because these people don't shake, they don't seize in a typical way, they actually act bizarre. And if you were to see this person during their seizure, 
you might think they're either uh, some kind of psychiatric patient who has not been taking their meds, or they're just really drunk, or they're just crazy. They act bizarre. These seizures can last a couple of minutes, they can last 20 minutes, and they act like they're nuts. So imagine if you get called to a, to a public place, a park, and you get called by PD for a man acting bizarre, and you go there and you see this person staggering around and crying out and screaming and pointing and doing all kinds of weird stuff, your first thought is, wow, this guy must be some kind of like schizophrenic or something, or maybe he's just really drunk, or maybe it's both, you never know, right? Well, in fact, these patients are having seizures, and they go through this, this period of seizure activity, and again, it could be five minutes, it could be 20 minutes, and they're completely unaware they're doing this. They have no recall. Once they come out of the seizure, they have no recall of it whatsoever. And so, you know, you might not know the difference, unfortunately. And unless there's a family member there who knows their history, you might never find out until you get them to the hospital and they figure it out there. Big thing with this course is they're, they're not seizing. Um, they're probably not even aware you're, of your presence. You might have to restrain these patients to get them to the hospital safely. Of course, safely restraining these patients. And we have a whole lecture on restraints. Um, and they might come out of it on the way to the hospital. You just never know on this. Now, Absan seizures, these were called petite mall seizures years and years ago. And this is the kid who stares off into space. And this is predominantly uh, children, usually under the age of about 10 years of age. Uh, but again, that can vary. Um, the kids playing with the blocks or writing down something or whatever it might be. And suddenly the kid just stares off into space and just spaces out. It usually lasts about 10 seconds or so. And when they come out of it, it's like they're waking up. They'll, they'll rub their eyes. They'll rub their face. And they'll have two and three and four of these in a row. And we usually don't get called out for these because mom and dad are aware that this child has this condition. Uh, they're probably on medications for it. If mom and dad leave the child with uh, like a daycare center, I'm sure they'd let the daycare center know that these seizures occur. And from my understanding, they usually do not progress into anything more serious than, than this. And the children do outgrow these over a period of time. Really, again, we don't get called out for them. Unless it's, unless it's a new onset or it's, it's a witness by someone who has never seen the child before, you might get called out. But they're, they're not harmful to the child and I almost guarantee that the parents are aware. Now, febrile seizures. Now, um, these are caused by fevers. Now, little, little babies, toddlers, um, they get infections all the time. They get fever all the time. It's not uncommon for a child to have a fever of 103, 104. Um, that's normal for them when they're, when they're having some kind of infection going on anyway. The problem with all this is because the child's uh, temperature control system is immature, their hypothalamus is immature, their body has trouble regulating their, their temperatures, especially if it spikes suddenly. So it's not so much how high the temperature goes, it's how quickly the temperature rises that causes the child to seize. So you have a child who has some type of viral infection going on, typical you know, stuffy nose, uh, earache, those types of things. And mom notices the child has a little fever going on. She gives them Tylenol to keep the fever down. And it's, it's, it's doing okay. And then let's say, and I'm just making this up as I go along, but let's say um, next morning mom is getting everyone ready to go to school and she forgets to give the infant or the young child with the fever another dose of Tylenol, and throughout the morning, the child's temperature spikes suddenly. It goes from 101 to 104 within a few minutes. The body can't compensate for this sudden rise in temperature, so it malfunctions and the child seizes. And the child seizes. Usually the upper arms will shake, the eyes will roll back in their head, they'll arch their back, and they'll point their toes. This is a pretty common febrile seizure. Now imagine you're that mom. Imagine you're that dad witnessing this. It's very frightening for the parents, unless this child has a history of it. Now, when you get on scene, more than likely, in most cases, the seizure will have stopped. 
the parents are really going to be freaked out. So in reality, yes, you have the infant or the young child as a patient, but the mom and dad are patients too. And you gotta, don't forget that. So talk to the parents, listen to what the story was, had this, had this infection, mom was giving them Tylenol, they forgot the dose of Tylenol, you'll get a rectal temperature on the child, you get a pulse oximetry reading, you get a blood sugar check. When you get there, more than likely the child will be very stable and will have definitely have stopped seizing by that time. They're probably still going to have a fever, so you can try some gradual cooling uh, measures, taking off their clothes down to their diaper. Uh, we don't want them to shiver. We don't want them to make them too cold because it can actually make them seize again. It's not just how fast the, the temperature spikes upward, it's also how quickly it spikes downward as well. In both cases, it can cause a seizure. So we want a gradual reduction of their body temperature over a period of like an hour or so. Uh, treatment is just going to be basically just maybe some blow by oxygen if you think it's necessary, but your real treatment is going to be mom and dad. Explain to them that this might be a febrile seizure caused by the infection. Uh, they do outgrow them. There's, they're not harmful to the child, but because it's the child's first febrile seizure, uh, they should be seen by a physician today. Take them to Children's Hospital. More than likely, figure out which parent is the calmest and then take the one in the back of the ambulance with you that's least calm and then have the calm one drive to the hospital in the car. You don't want them to crash, but that's up to you entirely how you want to work that one out. Um, there's two different types of these seizures. The simple version is the one I just described. It lasts about 20, 30, 40 seconds or so, and the child's fine. I do occasionally run into the complex version of this. They usually last, I believe, the definition of a complex febrile seizure is any seizure lasting longer than 15 minutes. And now we're talking about possible respiratory compromise and even remodeling of the brain leading to possible changes in their brain tissue. Um, and again, that's up to debate. Some doctors say yes, some doctors say no. Ultimately, if you arrive on scene and the mother says, well, my baby's been seizing for the last 15 minutes, uh, you should involve ALS. And ALS should stop that seizure for the, for the sake of the benefit of the mother and father as well as the child. Now, you arrive on scene uh, to a private residence, got a 24-year-old male, full body seizure while sitting at breakfast. Uh, when he seized, he fell out of the chair. You arrive there, he's laying on the floor, he's unresponsive. Because he fell, you're gonna have your partner take manual stabilization of the head and neck. And when he or she does that for you, they can perform a jaw thrust. You can look inside the mouth. You see this bloody saliva and foamy, frothy saliva in the mouth. You're gonna suction that. Remember, the seizure stopped. So you're safe to do so. You notice that there's a bump on his forehead. You get vital signs, which is fairly normal vital signs for people that are have gone through a seizure disorder. Uh, you're going to talk to the family, and you're going to find out this person has no history of seizures. He takes no medications whatsoever. You're going to get a blood sugar on him because it could be related to hypoglycemia. It does happen occasionally. And then you do find out, though, later on that he's a cocaine user. So more than likely, this was caused by cocaine. Um, but because of the bump on his head and because he's still unresponsive, even after you got him on the gurney going to the hospital, you should probably go to a trauma center because he could have hit his head pretty hard. He could have a bleed going on inside of his cranial vault, uh, internal injuries from the fall. And you treated him. You saved his life. You're now a hero. Go figure. So let's talk about a syncopal episode. So a syncopal episode is a temporary loss of consciousness caused by a temporary loss of blood flow to the brain. So as you know the definition, temporary loss of blood to the brain, patient wakes up once they're supine. So you have a person who's sitting in a chair, they get up too fast, and because of one reason or another, blood drains from their cranial vault, they become dizzy, they go unconscious, and they fall. Uh, I'm sure at some time in your life, you jumped up too quickly, and you got a little woozy, kind of almost blacked out. That's called a near syncopal episode. You didn't completely back black out. You didn't fall, but you got kind of almost there, essentially. So it's a near syncopal. Now, the causes are many. 
Some of them are benign. Uh, in the case of vasovagal, vasovagal is a term that relates to the body's response to an insult. Uh, if you've ever hit your thumb with a hammer while you're, you know, building a structure or something, that pain can be so intense that it causes your body to release mediators. And those mediators cause two things. They cause vasodilation of your blood vessels, and it causes your heart rate to slow down through the vagal nerve response. So if you, if you dilate your blood vessels and you slow down your heart rate, what happens to your blood pressure? It drops. So this person slams his hand in the door of a car or something, or commonly someone gets stuck with a needle and the pain from the needle can cause this as well, and it causes them to faint. Now, if you listen to the story, uh, you can kind of tell what's going on. A uh, person uh, you know, suddenly got a shot of penicillin in his bottom, and as soon as the nurse pushed the plunger, he fainted. That's a vasovagal response. Once they're on the floor, once they're supine on the floor, Blood will then flow back to the cranial vault, back to the brain, and they'll wake up. That's a typical syncopal response. Now, when it comes to older people, the uh, most common reason for a, uh, a, a syncopal episode in, in older people is usually cardiac related, meaning that for a period of time, for a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes, their heart was, was not beating effectively due to one condition or another and it dropped their blood pressure, thereby dropping the amount of flow of blood to their brain. It caused them to faint. And then once the heart started working again, uh, or they laid down on the floor in a supine position, blood flowed back, and they woke up. That's why we're so concerned about old people who faint, because a lot of times it is cardiac related. Now, psychogenic, uh, people do pass out from fear. Someone gets really scared, and they faint from from being frightened. Again, listen to the story, listen to what happened, let's listen to what the, the cause of it was. The same thing with the cardiac, if you, or even the vaso, the vaso, uh, vaso, vaso vagal. Listen to what happened, the, what preceded the event. Uh, the vaso vagal person says, I got stabbed with a needle. The cardiac patient says, I had some chest pain and then I fainted. And the psychogenic person says, you know, I had something frightened the heck out of me and I passed out. Now, orthostatic hypotension. As you age, uh, you, you, as you already know from our physiology, pathophysiology lecture, you develop uh, uh, hardening of the arteries. And of course, because of that, you're unable to vasoconstrict and vasodilate to, uh, to adjust for the orthostatic changes. Or, or the orthostatic, orthostatic changes are the change the position of your body. So if you're sitting and you go to standing, or you're lying flat, and you sit up, and you try to stand up. These are all orthostatic positions, essentially. So if you're an elderly person, and I don't know if you've ever seen this before, I don't know if you have interactions with elderly people, but if you have an older person sitting on a, on, on a chair, or they're laying in bed, they get up really slowly. And the reason why this is, is not that they probably can't get up quickly, but they know from past experiences, if they jump up too quickly, they get up too quickly. Because of the aging process, they can't compensate for that change in body position, and their blood vessels are not going to constrict quickly enough, and their heart rate's not going to increase quickly enough to compensate, and they're going to faint. So it's a, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, and so you have, a, you have a little old lady who uh, gets up too quickly, and she faints, hits the floor, she wakes up. Uh, you can talk to her what preceded it, what you would probably want to do just to rule out something like low fluid levels and things like that, is you'd probably want to do orthostatic vital signs. And we, we covered this during the vital sign lectures, but they're called, it's also called the tilt test. So while she's lying supine on the floor, lying on her back on the floor, or on her bed, wherever she might be, get her blood pressure and her pulse, and then carefully sit her up and wait about a minute or so and get her blood pressure and pulse again. If her blood pressure drops and her pulse goes off significantly, that's telling you that this, this fainting spell is probably from a low blood pressure or a low, low blood volume, something maybe unrelated to what we've been talking about already. Uh, but again, this is, you know, this is, you see primarily in older people, mostly because of the 
changes in the aging process or from the aging process and also the medications they take, especially uh, hypertension medications that affect their blood pressure. Treatment is just going to be symptomatic. Usually if they have it, if they've fallen and they hurt themselves, we're going to treat those injuries, spinal stabilization, bleeding control, those types of things. Okay, we're going to get a blood sugar on them because you never know. You know, oxygen saturation, you're going to apply oxygen if necessary, any below, any below 94%, give them some type of oxygen uh, to help them out. And um, that's pretty much your treatment right there. It's just a good idea to or take them to the hospital and have them evaluated by a physician just to rule everything else out. And we're done with chapter 19.